So let's start. Today we are going to talk about provable and generalizable adversarial defenses. So I'll have a quick recap of what we have already covered, and then I'll basically uh, switch gears to talk about uh, certifiable defenses, and at the end I'll be talking about generalizable defenses. All right, so unlike last time, uh, today we are going to use slides in order to cover uh, more space. All right, so we know what adversarial examples are. These are examples like X prime, where humans classify X and X prime the same way, but my model would predict different labels for X and X prime. Okay, so one key challenge in adversarial uh, robustness is that we don't have a good mathematical characterization of human perception, which is in fact really important even in the definition of adversarial examples that we uh, see here. So we discussed about this problem before, uh, how we get around this problem in the adversarial attack. In the adversarial attack, the goal is to create adversarial examples to mislead the classifier. So we are basically maximizing a classification loss given that X prime is within a particular threat model. And that's how we basically ensure that humans would classify X and X prime the same way by imposing this constraint on X prime. So this is called attack threat model. We often, this is often non-convex in a general case and we solve it using, as we dis discussed before, using uh, oftentimes projected gradient descent or some other variants of it. All right, so therefore each attack is specified by this attack algorithm and the threat model that we use in the attack optimization problem. All right, so what are the threat models that we have seen already? LP threat models, where we look at the LP distance between X and X prime to be within a particular uh, threshold row. The most commonly used uh, threat models are L1, L2, and L infinity. However, robustness against LP is very necessary to argue about the robustness of the model, but by no means it is sufficient. Why is that the case? Because we can come up with non-LP attacks that can break even very good defenses uh, for LP threat model. So in order to argue the robustness of the model, uh, in general, we should also look into robustness against non-LP attacks. Right, so what are the non-LP attacks? One example is sparse adversarial attacks. When adversary can change up to row pixels in the image, in order to craft an adversarial example. Another example is Washenstein adversarial attacks. It's introduced in 2019. Here, the adversarial perturbation is measured by Washenstein distance on normalized images. So I'm going to talk about Washenstein distance in uh, more details later on in uh, our lecture about generative models. Uh, but you can just think about Washenstein as a distributional distance between two distributions. And here we are going to normalize images to be represented as distributions. And the perturbation is going to be measured as a distributional distance between your input distribution and your perturbed distribution. So here you see one example that uh, you may have some special uh, perturbations uh, because of the Washenstein threat model and create, craft an adversarial example. Uh, and measuring these types of perturbations in LP is going to be a really, really uh, huge LP value between your input and output. Because for instance, if you just shift or you rotate uh, your uh, pixels a little bit, that will pose a really large LP uh, constraint, LP, LP distance. Uh, but in fact, it is a very small perturbation in, in a Washenstein point of view. All right, so there are other uh, non-LP threat models. For example, we introduced one uh, a threat model uh, called functional adversarial attacks in uh, last year's NORIPS. And the idea here is very simple. Here, the adversarial perturbation is a function of input features. So here in LP, the perturbation is defined uh, almost independently from the input uh, without any constraints coming from the input. But here, the perturbation that we define is going to be a function of, on, on the input. 
So if you have, for instance, red pixels, white pixels or gray pixels in your image, all white pixels, they are going to change similarly. All gray pixels, they are going to change similarly. So there's like this global constraint that coupling, uh, coupling them via this function uh, that we define. And in fact, you can uh, couple uh, these threat models. You can have a combined adversarial attack that uses combined threat models to have a stronger attack. But just to give you one really simple example uh, of use of functional adversarial attacks in practice, one attack that we uh, developed is called recolor ad, uh, where we adversarially recolor images. Right? As I mentioned, he, these perturbations are global perturbations in the image. If you have a blue sky, all of these pixels are going to change simultaneously to maybe a lighter blue or a darker blue. So therefore, even though your, your perturbation is more constrained, uh, the imperceptibility of them is going to be increased. So you can have a larger amount of perturbation uh, without being perceptible uh, from a human point of view. And you can take a look at the paper about the empirical performance, but what we have observed is that combining uh, different types of attacks, spatial attacks, recolor attack, and additive attack, uh, is basically providing us like a really strong attack, uh, even in the presence of uh, defenses like adversarial training that we already uh, discussed. All right, just that was a brief recap about uh, attacks. Now let's have a brief recap about uh, defenses. As I mentioned, one really popular defense is adversarial training. In, in a standard ERM, our goal is to pick model parameters theta that minimizes the average training loss. But in adversarial training, we are minimizing uh, the average uh, training loss, not on training samples, on worse perturbations of training samples. So one uh, good feature of adversarial training is that you can plug in different threat models for your inner maximization problem, right? So here I'm showing it for LP, but you can uh, recap this uh, inner maximization for other threat models as well. Again, we already discussed this, but we solve this adversarial training using alternating SGD for solving alter minimization and PGD for solving inner maximization, which is the attack problem. And again, adversarial training is coupled with a specific attack for solving the inner maximization. Uh, what is the attack algorithm that we use and what is the threat model uh, that we are using to constrain our perturbation? As I mentioned, there are many other heuristic defenses. Uh, for example, six, seven defenses uh, were introduced in ICLR 2018 for different threat models, robust defined classifiers on different data sets. All right, that was a brief recap of defenses. Now, when we have a defense, we can think about adaptive attacks. When adversary wants to break these particular defenses, uh, the attack, as I mentioned, has either an attack algorithm or the threat model. Let's assume the adversary is nice enough to use the same threat model that the defense uses. Right? Usually adversaries, they are not nice by definition, but let's say they are nice enough and they will only change the algorithm, the attack algorithm to break our defense. All right, so we discussed this uh, last lecture. In a follow-up paper in ICML, it has been shown that almost all of these empirical defenses can be broken. And we discussed the source of uh, these false sense of security coming from gradient masking or gradient obfuscation Notably, one defense was uh, uh, not completely broken, and in a later paper, this defense was uh, broken as well. So what it says, it says empirical defenses can be vulnerable against adaptive and stronger attacks, even within the same threat model. So I'm, this is like a nice adversary. So my adversary is not changing the threat model at this point. But why adversaries should be nice? By definition, they're adversaries, right? So they can actually use a different threat model to break the defense if you want to deploy them in practice. So in that case, we need to understand generalization of these defenses to unforeseen attacks. These are the cases when attackers 
don't obey the threat model used in the defense. We have observed that standard defenses, they actually have very poor generalization to these types of unseen attacks. For example, we did this experiment on CIFAR-10 uh, that we evaluate different adversarial training using different threat models, L-Infinity, L2, Spatial, and Recaller. We evaluate these defenses against different types of attacks using L-Infinity, L2, Spatial, and Recaller, uh, Recaller add attacks. So as you can see, the diagonal elements are pretty good. It kind of shows if you are at doing adversarial training against a particular threat model, it boosts the robustness of your model for that threat model. That's good. That's what we were uh, hoping for. But what about the off-diagonal elements? So here we are doing adversarial training against L-infinity. And now in attacker, my adversary is going to use L2. Now suddenly my performance accuracy from drops from 52% to 25%. What if I use a special attack? Then my performance further drops to 6%. Same observation we have for other uh, models as well. So this kind of shows adversarially trained based defenses have poor generalization against these types of unforeseen attacks if the attacker uses a different threat model that we used in, during the defense. And that can happen in practice, for sure. Okay, so in today's lecture, I'm going to focus on these two aspects that I described. One is when adversary uses the same threat model, but uses probably a stronger algorithm to break the defense. And in the second part, I'm going to focus on the case when the adversary uh, has this flexibility to even use a different threat model than the one uh, used during the defense. All right, so we'll start with part one, but maybe here I'll pause and see if there are any questions. This was basically a brief recap of what we already covered in the first uh, two lectures of adversary robustness. Professor, I have a question. Yes. Uh, in the previous page, uh, when you are uh, showing that when we are using a particular threat model and testing against another threat model, yes. Uh, but uh, we are seeing for some cases, uh, as for example, when we are testing against L infinity and um, the attacker is using uh, color, the uh, the performance is fifty nine point seven percent. So does this indicate anything like why is it higher compared to L-infinity and L-infinity threat model? It, that's a good point. So it is, I wouldn't read too much about, you know, these small, sometimes small increases. Uh, it kind of, you know, shows that this recaller at uh, attack is not a really strong attack. Right? So perhaps you can, you know, increase the, budget of perturbations because we are using the default budgets of perturbations for these attacks. So if you increase it further, it can, you know, come up with adversarial examples that is not contained within the particular threat model used during the defense. Okay. So for generally the recolor is showing like for all cases, it is a much higher accuracy. So. Right. So that indicates that the, uh, the attack by itself is weak. Right, so okay. it doesn't show the defense is strong. Okay, thank you. Good. Professor? Yes? So today we're just, you're gonna talk about methods for dealing with, when, with dealing with known, dealing when we know what the threat model is and then you're gonna cover methods that try to deal with when the threat models are not known? Yes. Okay. All right, so let's move on. Uh, so the first part, we are going to talk about certifiable or provable defenses. So what we mean uh, by uh, a certifiable defense, we say a classifier is certifiably robust at a point X, if for any X prime within a particular region around that point, based on the threat model that we consider, the output of the classifiers 
uh, for X and X prime will be the same. It's guaranteed to be the same. Right? So in a picture, if your classifier classifies your region to say a green and a blue region, and you're given an X here, uh, here row is our certification radius. So for any, there, there's no point within this sphere around X, if you are considering an L2, uh, there's no point uh, X prime that my model is going to produce a different label uh, than X for that particular point. So I'm certifiably robust around X with a certification radius of rho. So that's basically the definition of a provable or certifiable difference. That's kind of good because it says you can't come up with a stronger algorithm to break the defense given these, uh, these uh, guarantees. So that basically eliminates that sensitivity to a particular algorithm used during the defense or during that time. All right. So in the last uh, couple of years, there have uh, been a lot of interesting provable defenses proposed in the literature. So I'm going to give a big picture of uh, what is out there. Obviously, I'm like missing some specific uh, defenses, but here my goal is to provide like a landscape of these provable defenses. So one way to think about these defenses is based on the amount of the network information used during the defense. Again, I want to emphasize the attack is a white box attack. So the attacker knows everything, knows the model parameters, knows the model architecture, so on and so forth. But during the defense, you may not use all information or high level information from your network. You may only use input output relationships and you treat your network as a black box. You may use slightly more information from the network or you may use more information from your network. So that's how I'm going to categorize these provable defenses. Rule of thumb, if you're uh, in this part, when you are using, you know, maybe most of the times input output relationships, your defense is going to be more scalable. If you're in this extreme that you're using really high order information from your network, uh, your defense is going to be really good for smaller networks, but may not be very scalable to deeper networks. All right, so against LP, we basically have uh, three uh, regimes of defenses. One is based on randomized smoothing, which are very scalable defenses. Uh, we have interval bound propagation or convex relaxation based defenses. And recently we have introduced a curvature based uh, defense that looks at second order information, uh, curvature information from the network in order to guarantee uh, provable robustness against adversarial uh, attacks. All right, but what about non-LP? Because as I mentioned, robustness against LP is necessary, but by no means it is sufficient. So we also need to think about non-LP attacks. So we, there are some interesting uh, defenses uh, against sparse threat models that we describe against the Washington threat model and against patch threat model. Uh, out there. All right, so obviously I'm not going to be able to talk about all of them, uh, but I'm going to try my best to give you a feeling, a flavor of these types of uh, defenses, at least some of them. So we'll start with randomized smoothing based defenses, and then we'll uh, talk about one non-LP uh, defense, which is the sparse, um, uh, which is a provable defense against the sparse attacks. All right, so let's start with the randomized smoothing. Um, are there any questions up until this point? All right, if not, let me move on. So, what is randomized smoothing? We define a smooth classifier as the following. So you give me a classifier F. Now I'm going to add noise to its input. And this noise is going to have a particular distribution. For example, Gaussian smoothing, Gaussian randomized smoothing, we assume this distribution of this noise according to a Gaussian distribution with a zero mean and sigma squared times identity covariance matrix. 
And as my output, I'm going to just take the average of the outputs of my base classifier when I'm perturbing my input with respect to this uh, particular noise distribution. So that's basically the definition of a smooth classifier. You give me any function, actually I can do it for any function. You give me any function so I can smooth this up. I'll basically add noise to its input and I'll look at the average output as the output of my smooth classifier. So again, in a, from, a, uh, uh, from a picture point of view, so we have a base classifier. The idea here is that your base classifier may have some sharp edges and these edges, they are basically causing adversarial sensitivity because here I can uh, move X to this region with a small perturbation. But if I smooth this out, so instead of looking at this particular value uh, of my base at a particular point, if I look at the average in a, uh, in a ball around that you know, point, then basically I'll smooth out these you know, sharp edges in my decision boundary and hopefully I'll increase the robustness, the certifiable robustness of my model against adversarial attacks. That's basically the idea of randomized smoothing, really simple to use in practice. So you, you, you don't need to uh, have a particular you know, a change in your uh, model, it's just like changing your input by adding noise. And that's why at the beginning I mentioned these types of defenses, they, uh, most, mostly they use input-output relationship without really digging deep into the network architecture. All right, so Gaussian smoothing is actually really good against L2 adversarial attacks. There's this really nice result by uh, Cohen et al. that shows no adversarial example exists within this particular radius. Okay, so what is P1? P1 of X is the majority class probability. When you are doing your smoothing, and you are counting the uh, majority class, what is the probability of observing that class in your smooth samples? And P2 is the runner of class probability, and phi inverse is the inverse CDF of a standard normal. And sigma is the uh, variance of your smoothing. It's a really neat result. And the proof in, the, in their paper is based on uh, Neyman a classical uh, Neyman uh, person lemma. So one thing I wanna add here is that we don't have the exact values of P1 and P2 because this requires integration over Gaussian measure in a high dimensional space. So in practice, we compute upper and lower bounds for P1 and P2 based on empirical estimations of these values. So I'm not gonna go into the details of them, but you should take a look at uh, Cohen's paper to, uh, to see how this is uh, being done. But there is a, probably a simpler explanation of what is going on. That's something that you know, we have uh, provided at the same time. Salman Etl also provided this intuition that when you are doing smoothing, your smooth function f bar, if you look at the composition of that with phi inverse, which is the inverse CDF of your standard normal, this whole function is going to be Lipschitz with a constant one over sigma. And this immediately results this certification radius because if your function is Lipschitz, then if you change your input by uh, some uh, amount, then you have a bound on the change on uh, your outputs and that immediately gives you the robustness certificate. All right, so the question is how we can, how we can show this. Right, so uh, one way to prove this uh, result is based on name and person lemma. But here I'm going to provide a simple one dimensional proof for Gaussian smoothing by showing that in fact we have this Lipschitz constant on the composition of phi inverse and uh, the smooth function. Any questions? Um, could you define what Lipschitz means for a function to be a Lipschitz with constant one over? Oh, Lipschitz is like a bound on the the the, the gradients. Um, you should you know look at the the uh, linear algebra definitions of that. If you are not familiar, uh, you should you know review that part. 
Uh, any other questions? Okay, so let's see. Sorry, Professor. Oh, yes. okay. Please. Uh, yeah, sorry. But on the last slide, how does the um, Lipschitz constants for, you know, uh, phi inverse uh, f of x not depend on the Lipschitz constant of f itself? Like intuitively, that doesn't make sense to me. Shouldn't uh, there be a factor of l or for for l being the Lipschitz constant of f? So um, you you can actually come up with a Lipschitz constant. Oh, you mean f or f bar? Uh, f bar, f bar, f bar. So. Uh, F can be anything. You don't actually have a Lipschitz constant on F, but you can actually show that F bar also has a Lipschitz constant. If you're doing a smoothing, uh, you get a Lipschitz constant that is, um, you know, roughly speaking, the same behavior of one over sigma. Mm -hmm. But the good thing about looking at phi inverse of uh, F bar is that, look at this function. When your input is close to one or close to zero, the derivative of this function is really high, right? Yeah. yeah. So that basically shows the since the composition is Lipschitz with this constant, you have a better bound on the Lipschitz uh, value of f bar for those types of inputs that we wouldn't see when if if we just look at the Lipschitz constants of f bar. So this provides like a more uh, tight, a tighter uh, certification, and in fact, this is the tightest uh, robustness uh, radius, certified robustness radius that you can obtain. But yes, the short answer is that you also get a Lipschitz constant on F bar, roughly speaking, same behavior, uh, inversely proportional to sigma. Okay, awesome, thank you. Good. All right, so let's see how we can prove this uh, ourselves. Um, all right, so let's look at two points, x and x prime, uh, that are uh, uh, basically rho uh, away from one another. All right, so I'm going to use a change of basis because we are in a, a rotation invariant situation doing Gaussian smoothing. So it really doesn't matter how you are uh, changing, how, where you are putting your basis. So I'm going to put my x at the origin and I'm going to put my x prime at rho zero, zero, zero. So this is going to be my uh, first axis, along my first axis. And I'm going to define this one dimensional function. This function G uh, is basically a smooth version of my function F when I'm doing smoothing on the last D minus one components, coordinates. So I'm basically adding noise to these coordinates. I'm smoothing them out. And I'm looking at basically the value of my base. And for smoothing, again, I'm going to use a Gaussian with a zero mean and a sigma squared uh, variance. So that's a one dimensional function. But so this is, a, again, a, not a high dimension. It's a one dimension. A scalar input, a scalar out. So we can also look at the smooth version of this scalar uh, function when I'm adding Gaussian noise to this input. So that's what we are going to refer to as G bar, which is the smooth version of this one dimensional function. All right, so all I actually need to show, it is not hard to see, all I actually need to show is to show phi inverse of this G bar is Lipschitz because smoothing first on D minus one component and on the last component, you can see that it clearly is equivalent to smoothing all of these D components. So all I need to show here is the composition of phi inverse, which is the inverse CDF of normal, and this G bar, which is the smooth version of this one dimensional function is Lipschitz. Right, so let's see why that's the case. All right, so in order to understand this, we need to look at the worst G. What is the G? that gives me the largest Lipschitz constant for phi inverse composed with G bar. So to pick your favorite G. Let's say this is a G that I pick. Uh, the range is between zero and one. And smooth this out. I compute G bar of Z. Uh, 
I'm basically adding Gaussian uh, noise to this input and I'm looking at G bar. But remember, we have a constraint. It is not just any, I cannot pick any G here. The constraint that I have is that G bar at zero, uh, which is zero is my input. That's basically my measurement. When I'm doing smoothing, I'm measuring the output for my input. And here my input is zero. So G bar is zero is given. So that's basically one input to, your, to my, uh, my certifier, uh, certification. So let's say maybe that number is 0 0.091. Right? So you are basically looking at your output of your function when you're smoothing uh, in your particular input and that's basically the number that you get. So I cannot pick any arbitrary G. So I should pick a G where when I'm smoothing that function, I'll basically get this particular number uh, evaluating at my input, which is here sitting at zero. <clears throat> And now I have this G bar, but I'm not looking at, as your you know, friend mentioned, maybe I can look at the Lipschitz constant of this function, but I'm more interested in looking at Lipschitz constant of phi inverse composed with G bar. So I'm gonna basically have this particular uh, shape for this particular example. And even from this picture, you can see, okay, for this particular G, then I have actually a Lipschitz output as my phi inverse composed with G bar. But that's for one instance of G. What would be the worst G that gives me the highest Lipschitz on phi inverse composed with G bar? Because that would be the bound, because I wanna basically have an upper bound on the Lipschitz constant of phi inverse G bar for all G satisfying this constraint, obviously. Any guess? What would be the phi inverse phi? Say it again. Phi inverse of phi. Uh, phi uh, inverse or uh, phi inverse of phi? That would be identity, right? What would be the worst G? Okay, let's think about it. You know, here uh, you are doing Gaussian smoothing, right? So you are adding a Gaussian noise to your G and you are taking the average. Here you have some positive values. Here you have smaller positive values. Here you have negative values. When you're adding a Gaussian here, then your positives and negatives somehow uh, mix up with each other. And then you get um, a, a little bit of a more smooth transition from positives to negatives. So what would be the worst intuitively G? What if you know I have like a step function like this? And if I basically do a smoothing here, uh, these parts are going to be very positive still because you know I'm smoothing you know, positive numbers. Uh, I'll have like some transitions here because I'm dropping from positive to zero. And then I'll have um, small numbers you know, on the other side. So if you do a smoothing uh, of this function, you'll basically get this function as your uh, smooth uh, classifier. But again, remember this threshold is chosen in a way that I get G bar of zero to be equal to my constraint. Let's say this is like a given number for me. All right, so if you look at this uh, curve, this is like the mirror version of my phi inverse. So when I apply a phi inverse to it, I'm gonna get just a straight line. In fact, the slope of this straight line is just one over sigma. And this is the worst function that you can get as your input that gives you the largest, uh, largest uh, Lipschitz constant of phi inverse composed with G bar. And that's it. And in fact, it is type because I can find a classifier. This is a linear classifier that will give me this particular Lipschitz constant for uh, my output. Phi inverse uh, composed with G bar. Okay, so that's like a proof by picture, uh, but you can actually write this down. 
I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but you can uh, do like a change of variable here. You define g sub phi of y as g of uh, sigma times phi inverse of y. And it's a very straightforward one dimensional calculus that you can show that g bar of rho is actually greater than this number. But remember, we have this constraint that in the smooth function, I want the value to be equal to the given value that I have. So this is a monotonically increasing function, this part. So the worst g that I can obtain is a step function. And the threshold that when I'm switching from one to zero depends on uh, basically the constraint that you have, but you can carefully choose that uh, threshold in order to satisfy your constraint. And that's gonna give you the worst Lipschitz of phi inverse uh, composed with your uh, smooth function. And then that's it. Then you basically get uh, this really nice result that uh, for any function phi, if you just look at the composition of phi inverse uh, and f bar, which is the smooth version of that function, that's Lipschitz. That's it. And that's how you get basically your guarantee against L2 attacks. Clear? Right, so that's basically randomized smoothing and the guarantees that we get. And usually for L2, you can use Gaussian noise uh, for randomized smoothing. Uh, these papers, they use other noise types for uh, noise distributions for L1 attacks. Uh, they use Laplace noise. In fact, there was a recent paper that they argued that in fact, Laplace noise is not good for uh, L1. So you need to look at the conjugate of these uh, norms in order to have a more proper uh, shape of noise. But in a broad sense of view, the one question is that, okay, no, what are proper smoothing distributions against different uh, types of LP attacks, right? So if you use like, instead of L2, if you have a L3 attack, L4 attack, then what should be the shape of your noise distribution? Should you use still a Gaussian distribution? Maybe should you use like other types of distribution to have like a better robustness certificate? So these are uh, important questions in order to understand generalizability of these results to other uh, types of um, attacks when we are not just using L2 attacks. Okay, I see some questions in the chat box actually. Oh, okay, so good. Happy you guys are answering each other's questions. <clears throat> All right, so in other words, we need to understand generalizability of randomized smoothing. So we have a recent result on uh, this problem, which we show for using any symmetric IID smoothing distribution, not Gaussian, any symmetric IID smoothing. We have this following upper bound on the robustness radius against any LP attacks. Again, not just L2. Basically, this result is fairly general. Use any symmetric IID smoothing, pick any LP attack, then your certificate is going to be upper bounded by this number. Again, you have already seen P1 and P2. These are the probabilities of the uh, top classes. Sigma is the variance of uh, your smoothing distribution. But additionally, here we have an extra dependence on D when P is larger than two. In the Gaussian case, we assumed we are looking at the P2 uh, attacks, L2 attacks. We did not have this dependence on D. But we observed that in this upper bound, for P larger than two, we see an additional dependence on the dimension. What does this mean? It means we observe a curse of dimensionality uh, on or robustness radius for larger input sizes then this upper bound for your robustness radius, uh, provable robustness radius is going to further decrease by your dimension. And in those regimes, therefore randomized smoothing or smoothing based defenses may actually not be a good defense in general. 
right? So you have already seen some other types of uh, curse of dimensionality in the previous lecture that we talked about isoparametric, uh, isoparametric inequalities. Here, another place that we see these types of curse of dimensionality that for uh, large inputs, the radius that we can certify or methods under the conditions of this theorem using uh, smoothing uh, is going to decrease uh, based, on, uh, based on the dimension that you have for your inputs. Is, is this result clear? Okay. So then you can, uh, okay, so let me see if I wanna, okay, I'll just skip this result. Then you can ask, all right, that's a, like an upper bound, right? So what if I'm lazy and I use just Gaussian smoothing for other LP attacks as well? And based on the similar argument and changing the radius of L2 to LP, you immediately get this following certificate using Gaussian smoothing against LP attacks. But from more upper bound, this is the formula that I just showed you, we know we have an upper bound on the robustness radius for any symmetric IID smoothing against LP attacks. So ignore all of these constants that depend on P1 and P2. There are some factors, you know, two here, two square root of two, ignore all of them and just focus on the behavior of these bounds for uh, with respect to sigma, the smoothing uh, variance and the dimension and p. It's basically roughly the same. Right? So you have some constant differences, but roughly speaking, it is the same. It kind of means that up to some constants, Gaussian smoothing is actually optimal. Of course, within the IID smoothing distributions uh, against LP attacks. So that indicates, this is a fundamental result, indicating that if you really, really try hard uh, to develop other types of smoothing distributions for other LP attacks, you may get some constant gain, but you are not going to see a significant gain, especially in high dimensional inputs. All right. Uh, any questions? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Is the RP star that you showed in the, pre, uh, in the theorem, is it a provably tight radius? It, it is an upper bound, right? right? So in the Gaussian case, I mentioned it is realizable. So I can come up with a classifier that can actually has that particular uh, robustness radius. So that's a realizable um, certificate. Here, we are not claiming that. We are saying it's an upper bound. You may come up with a tighter upper bound, but probably not too much tight because we already know Gaussian is realizable and these two bounds, the bounds that we have here, asymptotically behaves as the realizable Gaussian bound. So uh, in short, it is tight, but we don't know if it is realizable to have the exact the same constants uh, as we have in this theorem. Makes sense, thank you. Okay, so we have um, about half an hour left. Um, okay, there's another question in the chat. What is the intuition behind robustness decreasing with dimensionality? What about robustness uh, increasing um, with P? So robustness decreases with dimensionality because in a high dimensional, uh, data, you have more dimensions that you need to protect against, right? So think about, you know, you know it's kind of like a, you know, quote unquote, a rigged game against the defense, right? Because the attacker doesn't have to distribute it is attacking power or attacking budget across different dimensions, right? So attacker can pick just one dimension, one direction, and basically perturb your, uh, your inputs along that direction and break your defense. But on the other hand, defense unfortunately has to defend against all of directions in order to have a provable defense, right? So there's a mismatch between the games that they attack and the defense they play. Uh, 
right? So the defense should have, you know, robustness against across all of the directions, but the attacker can just pick one direction and attack. And that's why in high dimension, uh, it is basically much more difficult to defend against, uh, against uh, such adversaries. Make sense? Okay, good. So, good, good, good. Uh, I have about 25 minutes and I'm thinking what to cover. Uh, okay, so I'm going to skip some of these uh, things because I wanna basically give a more uh, broader picture. You can take a look at some of the experimental results, some of the other theoretical results in the paper. So I'm going to skip them. Uh, and I'm also going to skip the proof of that, uh, that theorem that I mentioned. So the proof is kind of, you know, following the same proof I showed for randomized smoothing, but you can take a look at the paper, not a really uh, difficult uh, proof. Uh, so in the next, uh, probably 10 minutes, I wanna talk about at least one non-LP defense just to give you a feeling about these types of defenses. Uh, okay, so yeah, as before, I'm going to uh, share the video of the lectures uh, and we'll have the scribe notes. All right, so let's uh, focus on sparse uh, threat model. All right, so what is the sparse threat model? Here, adversary can change up to raw pixels in the image. So if you're, you have an input image, you have uh, basically adversary picks raw pixels in the image. So this is a really important model because if you think about it, you know, uh, if you, here we are saying that adversary can change any raw pixels, right? There are no constraints on the pixels. But in terms of patches, these pixels can be basically physically close to each other and form a patch. And patch uh, attacks and defenses, they are really, really practical because you can put an adversarial patch on stop sign. Don't do it, but uh, you know, potentially you can do that. Right? So that's a really serious threat model, very close to the application. And um, you know, I wanna highlight that we actually have a certifiable uh, defense against patch attacks uh, that, that's going to appear in NURIPS this year. And that basically leads to state of the art uh, provable defenses uh, for very important patch threat model. But the foundation of that result is actually the sparse, understanding the sparse threat model. So that's why I'm going to focus on the sparse threat model, but I wanna emphasize the importance of uh, these threat models in practice. All right, so that's basically the sparse threat model. And there are some certifiable defenses, uh, where certifiable defenses out there based on randomized smoothing, for example, this paper, by Lee et al that they pro provided a robustness certificate up to four pixels on e MNIST and one pixel on ImageNet. It means that say, four if for any four pixels that you change on MNIST, your output is going to stay the same. So that's basically the type of robustness certification that we have. On ImageNet, uh, that, that paper provided. On ImageNet, they, pro they provided up to one pixel. All right. So here, the question is, can we come up with like a better uh, smoothing uh, defense uh, for, against these types of attacks? So the answer is yes. So what we propose is uh, an approach based on randomized ablation. The idea is actually really, really simple. Right? So uh, I would say this can be taught in high school, you know, uh, probably like, you know, a uh, really, really simple approach. So the idea is use K randomly selected pixels out of D pixels in the classification. You give me an input, I'm not gonna use all of my pixels. Why should I? I don't pr probably, I don't need all of my pixels. I'm going to select K random pixels and I'm going to classify, uh, classify each of these ablated uh, samples uh, with ablated pixels. Maybe here it's going to correct the, uh, predict the correct label. Sometimes, you know, I'm going to, you know, misclassify because I'm not using 
all of my input pixels, right? So if you use, if you just keep one pixel, if your case is one, then it's not gonna be good, right? So the, with one pixel, you cannot classify your input. But maybe if I use like maybe K25 or 30, that's gonna give me, roughly speaking, a good information about my input. And my classifier is able to, you know, with a good probability going to predict a good label here. Other pixels, I'm going to uh, encode it as null pixels. They are very far from uh, the pixels that we keep just to make sure that my classifier is not relying on any of them. All right, let's call PI of X the probability that X gets the label I using randomly ablated samples. This is the probability of predicting, you know, uh, predicting label I. So let's say I have here three examples. So the P2 of X would be two over three. So at least two out of my three uh, ablated samples, they uh, predict the label two. All right. So then we can actually come up with a robustness certificate using a really easy combinatorial bound. And here's the bound that we have. If you give me two inputs, X and X prime, that are different from one another in row pixels, the L0, L0 is not a norm. It's a, it's a semi-norm. So the L0 distance between X and X prime is row. So I'm changing row pixels from X to X prime. Then for all I's, for all classes, pick your favorite class, the probability that I would have P uh, basically as in my output, that class uh, using the randomized ablation would be sufficiently close to the probability of that class if I perform this randomized ablation on X prime. And they, the, the gap between them is going to be bounded by this uh, quantity delta. What is this quantity delta? This is the probability that any of adversarially perturbed pixels is used in classification. So this is a really simple bound, right? So let's understand this. So in this part, I have, remember, I have D pixels in my input and I'm in my randomized ablation, I'm keeping K of them. So D choose K is the you know, number of possibilities that I, I, I can keep these uh, uh, K pixels in my classifier. But I don't want any of these K pixels that I'm keeping to overlap with row pixels that maybe adversary is going to pick. Right, so the number of possibilities in that case is D minus row choose K because I want to pick these K's, K pixels I'm retaining in my classification, not overlapping with any of the row contam con basically noisy pixels, no uh, row uh, pixels that my adversary can potentially attack. So basically it's the probability that I don't have any overlap. And the complement of that probability is that I have at least one, one of my uh, pixels can be overlapping with the pixels adversary is going to attack. Right? So that's basically the bound that we have here. So then trivially after uh, this really easy combinatorial bound, then we get a robustness certificate because if my delta is small enough, it means my output probabilities for classes, even after row, uh, pixel perturbation is going to stay close to their original probabilities. Then if I have a larger gap between my uh, first class and the runner up class, uh, twice as the, you know, this much uh, gap that I have here because my runner up class can go up by delta, my uh, top class can go down by delta. So if my gap is larger than twice as this gap, uh, this uh, probability, then I'm good. So I can certify uh, my robustness against any uh, sparse attacks with a budget of four. Right, so you can immediately from this formula see there is a trade-off uh, between uh, uh, for this delta uh, for different k's. Right, so larger k that you have, right, so you keep more samples, more pixels, then the collision probability is going to increase. Right, so because you are retaining more pixels. In the extreme case, if you keep all of your pixels, then for any row pixels adversaries chooses, then you know, you're going to definitely have a collision. 
So a smaller k is better for us uh, because this delta gap is going to be smaller. But a smaller k means <clears throat> that you are retaining fewer pixels in your classification. Then your accuracy can drop. Right? So there's this trade-off, this intrinsic trade-off that we observe between the accuracy of the model and the certification uh, level that we can guarantee. Okay, so let me pause. I see some questions. Yes, you know, here we are using the same, the same uh, K for all samples, just for simplicity. Maybe you can come up with, you know, a better way of doing this, but we just, you know, did this uh, use just one K for all samples. All right, so again, you can look at the evolution of your accuracy and the robustness for different case. So the, the, we, we see like this uh, kind of a bell shape, uh, reverse bell shape uh, behavior uh, that at the beginning, if you keep just five pixels, then of course your base accuracy is going to be low. Kind of surprising actually, right? So on MNEST, if you keep only 15 pixels, your classification accuracy can be 86%. That was actually for me a little bit surprising. 15 pixel is like really nothing, right, um, for MNIST. Uh, but here, uh, more pixels that you, uh, you pick, obviously the classification accuracy increases, uh, but then you have this sweet spot for your, uh, for your robustness uh, that has a good balance between your classification accuracy and your certified robustness. All right, just to compare with the, uh, uh, with the empirical uh, results that we have with the previous state of the art, remember the previous paper, the previous state of the art, they certified up to four pixels on MNIST. So we can certify up to eight pixels using this really simple method to double uh, the robustness radius we have. On ImageNet, the previous method could certify only one pixel. So here we could certify up to 16 pixels. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, th these are still the state of the art uh, robustness, uh, certified robustness uh, results uh, for sparse attacks. All right, uh, we also looked into the empirical robustness of these defenses and it's pretty good. Actually, it is better than other empirical defenses as well. So that kind of, you know, you know it has a message, right? Sometimes, you know, these robustness uh, radius can be relatively small, maybe eight pixels, 16 pixels. Uh, but in practice, actually, the, you know, the, the defense can be also be uh, robust, uh, more robust than other empirical defenses. So there is more merit in thinking about these provable and certifiable uh, defenses than just looking at the certification radius. <clears throat> Okay, so there's a question about uh, how we do the ablation uh, with uh, null encoding. So I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. So I'll just skip this part. Just briefly speaking for uh, the null encoding, because for the pixels that we don't keep, we are encoding, we are ablating those pixels. We have two approaches. They roughly speaking uh, perform the same. One approach is based on doubling the number of channels and encode the null as zero, zero. Uh, the other pixels, they are going to have two values, they sum up to one, but the null is very, going to be very far from uh, those pixels. We also looked into other approaches, for example, encode null as the mean value of the data set, uh, for example, like a gray pixels in the MNIST case, and that works fine too. So we, we see like a really small differences uh, between the two cases. All right, so that's all I wanted to say about uh, provable defenses, right? So here I knew the threat model. I knew, okay, you're using L2, you're using LP, or you're using sparse or whatever, right, patch. So that's, that's known. But in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes, I wanna talk about the case that you don't know. What's your threat model uh, to start with? Uh, all right, so, how we can deal with uh, those types of problems. Uh, we have a, a really recent works on, on this. So I'm going to talk about some of those results. This is uh, 
a problem that hasn't been really studied much in, in the literature. So I would say probably 99% of results in adversarial robustness to the state focuses on part one. So there are really few <clears throat> results focusing on part two, which I believe is really, really important. And that's why I'm emphasizing, uh, I'm emphasizing this part uh, during this course as well. All right, so in order to understand this problem, we need to <clears throat> think about relationship between different threat models. All right, so as I mentioned, we have like this unrestricted threat model that images, they, are uh, they, they can have perceptible or imperceptible changes as long as they don't change the true label of, uh, of the image when we are doing these perturbations. For example, if you put a patch on an image, this is a perceptible change, right? But it doesn't change the label if you're putting patch not on like the main part of your image. But within this, we mainly focused on imperceptible adversarial examples. These are the examples that you actually can tell the difference between your input clean X and your adversarial example X prime. It is a subset of these unrestricted uh, adversarial examples. And these are also like uh, probably more worrisome because even if you have a human in the loop, they won't be able to detect these types of adversarial perturbations. All right, so as I mentioned, we don't have a good characterization of this set. So therefore we are doing like a, what I call a, a bottom-up approach. We try to fill this in using restrictive specific thread models like LP thread model, a spatial threat model like Washenstein, uh, sparse or patch threat model, we try to basically fill this in. But the problem is that first of all, you know, uh, we, we, we don't know if it is, we are robust against any of these threat models. Even if you are robust against any of these threat models, that may not generalize to other threat model. But let's say we actually have a defense that not only is robust against LP, it is also robust against spatial, it is robust against patch. But there may be a lot of other examples that is not contained in the union of these threat models. So we'll still be vulnerable against those types of adversarial examples. So that's, that's the big, big caveat I wanna emphasize that exists in almost like all current defenses that we see in adversarial robustness. All right, so what is, uh, what is our approach? So we have proposed a different view to this problem. Instead of like this bottom-up approach, we are proposing a top-down approach to directly approximate this bigger set, the set of all imperceptible adversarial examples. How we are going to do that approximation, we are going to use neural networks. So instead of looking at the true perceptual distance between X and X prime, we are going to approximate it using a neural perceptual distance and will define a neural perceptual threat model as the set of all examples with a neural perceptual distance between X and X prime within a particular threshold. All right, so that's basically the key idea to use deep networks to approximate the true perceptual distance in the adversarial threat model. But obviously there are several challenges. What are the proper neural perceptual distance functions? Then the attack is going to be more complicated, the attack optimization, because we have non-convex constraints in the attack. And in the defense, we'll have a new front of vulnerability because the threat model, because it itself is based on neural network, can be attacked. All right, so in that uh, paper, which is on archive, uh, we basically deal with all of these uh, challenges. So regarding the first challenge, to understand the human perception, this is an age old problem in computer vision. In fact, there are several classical surrogates out there and there are some recent proposals uh, such as LPIPS. So in our uh, work, we rely on LPIPS distance, which is the learned perceptual image patch similarity as or neural perceptual distance between X and X prime. So briefly speaking, uh, what LPIPS is doing is 
basically if you give me a convolutional uh, function with L layer convolution classifier, first I'm going to look at the channel normalized internal activations of each layer and then I'm going to renormalize them by the width and the height of these each layer and define a feature map. So you give me a convolutional network, all these define these feature maps based on these normalizations that I mentioned. Then my neural perceptual distance between X and X prime is just L2 distance between feature maps of X and X prime. That's it, really simple. And it, in fact, it really correlates well with human perception. So I'll show uh, some, uh, some results about that. All right, uh, after defining this threat model, you can write down your optimization, attack optimization, replacing uh, your constraint with the particular threat model that you have. Again, the objective is non-convex as before, but here your constraints are also non-convex. Right before we had L2, it was an easier or L1 or L infinity easier constraint, but here you have non-convex constraints here that needs to uh, be a more careful treatment in order to have a successful attack. What about G? Remember this phi feature map is defined using this perceptual network, this uh, G function, which is a convolutional network. There are two options for G. The attacker can use the same perceptual network as the classification network. This function F and G, they can be the same thing. This is called self-bounded attack but it can be a different function. And in that case, we call it externally bounded attack. So we have basically two, two variations of them. So using this uh, framework, we extended the PGD attack that I described in the lecture uh, and we proposed perceptual projected gradient descent. I'm not gonna go into the details of it. You can take a look in the paper. And the Carlini and Wegener, Wegener attack that used the Lagrangian relaxation, again, you can have a perceptual version of it using these perceptual constraints and we basically developed this LPA attack uh, based on that. Just as a note, uh, in our experiments we have observed LPA is the strongest adversarial attack even in the presence of adversarial training. This is really, really an amazing attack. Uh, that uh, I don't think you know, any defense is uh, very successful against this attack. Right, so let's look at some example attacks by LPA. Here I have my input, and this is an adversarially perturbed version of the input, and this is the magnified difference. And as you can see, this is not just L2. If you look at the lighting of this part of this jewelry, it's different. If you look at the chains or the strings, in an automatic fashion, it has changed kind of the types of the strings in order to craft an adversarial example. This is like a really, really smart uh, attack to make these imperceptible changes to create adversarial examples. For instance, here, the attack changes the background here, changes the edges slightly here, it changes the texture of this snowman on the sock. But again, none of them is integrated in a hard fashion. It is done by the perceptual constraint that we are imposing using a, another neural network. And that's, I think, the beauty of uh, this type of attack. All right, so I'll skip this. You can do adversarial training using the perceptual model that we have. That's what we call perceptual adversarial training. Again, you have two versions, self-bounded and externally bounded perceptual adversarial training. All right, so one thing I'm gonna skip is we don't know mathematically how good this approximation is, but we can do human evaluation on Amazon Mechanical Torque, and that's in fact what we did. Uh, so let me just show a small clip of this human evaluation that we show two pairs of images uh, to the participants and ask them which one is real. And they have like, you know, two seconds in order to uh, basically identify it. And based on that, we can kind of approximate the perceptibility of these attacks and see if it correlates with our neural perceptual distance. And in fact, what we observe is, yes, it does correlate uh, pretty well 
with uh, with human perception this the neural perceptual distance that we have here all right so let me finish with uh, some of the results that we got on c4 as i mentioned if you do adversarial training on these specific models and then you look at other attack threat model then you get a really significant drop in your performance but what about, uh, for example, the perceptual adversarial training that we are introducing here? Yes, against L infinity, let's compare it with adversarial training against L infinity. Against that particular threat model that I'm hardening my classifier, yes, of course that adversarial training is going to beat us because we are not you know, saying this is robust against this particular threat model. But against other threat models, let's look at L2, we have like you know 25% improvement against spatial. We have again uh, more than 40% improvement. Even against recaller app, which is like probably among the weakest of these attacks, we have more than 15% uh, improvement. So this kind of shows looking at this problem from this point of view, from a perceptual point of view, can actually help to develop defenses that are not tied to a particular threat model. It is more generalizable to uh, different threat models. And here I want to highlight again, this LPA attack that we have is really, really strong. So it basically breaks all of these defenses that we have. Even PAT, it has a better performance compared to other methods, uh, but still the performance is, you know, below 10%. Uh, and as I mentioned, PAT uh, shows high unforeseen attack robustness on C410. We have other results on ImageNet uh, in the paper that you can take a look. All right, that's all I wanted to say for the, uh, today's lecture. So basically the first part, we talked about provable defenses, uh, focusing on a particular threat model and looking at uh, basically certification levels of different defenses. We talked about randomized smoothing. We talked about the curse of dimensionality of, of these uh, smoothing based methods. And also we talked about non LP attacks like uh, sparse attacks and how we can certify against those types of attacks. And in the next part, uh, in the second part, I talked about thinking about generalization of these defenses to threat models and to attacks that are not used in the defense. So we want to have a defense that is robust across the board to uh, use in practice. All right, so I think that's all I have uh, and I'll pause and take your questions at this point.